All right, good evening. Thank you all for joining us for the first Povich panel of the fall semester. We wanted to let you know that we will be recording this panel and it will be posted on our YouTube channel next week. Throughout the discussion, we encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. After our initial conversation, we will open things up for questions, but you do not need to wait to submit them. We will be discussing an important and difficult topic tonight centering on mental health and sports. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that if you or someone you know is having thought suicidal thoughts or is in emotional distress, there is help. You can contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK or at suicidepreventionlifeline.org. We're gonna be posting this information in the chat so that it's available. We encourage everyone to take care of themselves and prioritize their mental health. Now I'd like to turn things over to Mark to get started. Thank you, Caitlin, and, and good evening, everyone. Glad you could join. We're talking tonight about an issue that's important, that's complex, and that touches sports with implications well beyond sports. And, and that seems to be our specialty at the Povich Center, and it's by design. One of our core missions is to lead a national conversation on sports, politics, race, gender and health and safety. Just as our namesake Shirley Povich did each morning in the Washington Post for nearly 75 years. Tonight, we're considering mental health and wellness, topics as important as any in sports today. Is something changing profoundly before our eyes? What are the new challenges for athletes under increased scrutiny and pressure? for journalists attempting to tell their stories responsibly and for player representatives tasked with protecting their clients. We'll talk about all that and we wanna hear from you. So please type your questions into the chat box during the panel discussion and I'll reappear in about 30 minutes to pose as many as we can to the panel. Now to introduce tonight's moderator and panel, I'd like you to meet Jasmine Boykin a senior at Merrill College and one of our most accomplished multi-platform sports journalism students. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Mark. Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's discussion on unseen stories covering mental health and sports today. Um, I'm Jasmine Boykin, a senior here at Merrill and I'm honored to introduce our star-studded panel group of panelists. And our panelists tonight include Jerry Bembry, who is a senior writer at The Undefeated, who in a recent column encouraged tennis star Naomi Osaka to take the time she needed to focus on her mental health. We also have Peter Carlisle, who is the managing director of Olympics and action sports at the global sports marketing agency, Octagon Worldwide. We also have Paul Doherty, who is a sports columnist at the Cincinnati Inquirer, who has covered nearly every major American sporting event in addition to five summer Olympic games. We also have Amber Theo Harris, who is a Merrill alumna and a journalist, tech executive, filmmaker, and producer. Theo Harris has appeared on the NFL Network, Fox Sports One, uh, Fox Sports, and the NFL on Westwood One. And lastly, we have Katie Ulander, who is a four-time Olympic skeleton racer who has won six medals at the FIBT World Championships. And tonight's program will be moderated, moderated by Merrill alumna, Bonnie Bernstein, who is also the founder of Walk Swiftly Productions. Thank you all so much for coming and joining the Povich Center for this very important conversation. And I will now turn it over to our moderator, Bonnie Bernstein. Asmund, thank you so much and welcome to everybody who is joining us this evening to discuss what has become a huge topic among athletes and for us as journalists. As Mark had mentioned, we would love you to take part in the conversation. We're gonna do a Q&A session at the bottom of the hour. You can either put your question in the chat uh, only Mark uh, will see those questions, or if you are online and you want to tweet questions, we're going to be live tweeting this at the Povich Center account or uh, on Twitter. It's at Povich Center and use the hashtag unforeseen, uh, unseen stories, uh, just so you can be on the radar. Um, Bonnie, real quick, I just wanted to clarify, um, they're not seeing the chat, they'll insert the questions in the Q&A function okay. um, at the bottom, it's not the chat, just so okay. we're clear. All right, Jess, thank you. All right, so let's start with the why from the journalist perspective. And, and Jerry and Paul, I'd love to start with you. I feel like not all that long ago, 
we in the media weren't talking about mental health. For me personally, the watershed moment was the Kevin Love piece that ran in the Players Tribune. If you're not familiar with it, it was a first person account of how Kevin was really struggling with depression. And it was eye-opening because it was coming from his voice. And I remember reading it and saying, A, that it was really brave, but B, this is going to open the doors and it's going to say to athletes, it's okay to talk about something that has been stigmatized for years and years. Um, Jerry, let's start with you. Why did you think there wasn't much in the way of conversation when it came to mental health and sports before Kevin's piece? You know, I, I think that when you look at athletes, you always look at them as tough guys. I remember I played high school football and I remember before the first game in my freshman year, the coach came and said, you know, if, if you get hurt on the field, your, your leg better be broken. Or, you know, you don't, don't ask me to come out there and look after you if, if you, you know, your leg better be broken or, or else drag yourself off, off the field. So they want everybody to be tough to kind of hide their pain and just kind of deal with stuff. And so Kevin Love comes out. Here's a guy who's an NBA champion, who's one of the top basketball players in the world. And he writes about, uh, you know, when he wasn't performing that he wasn't really succeeding as a person. He writes about um, going to his room, um, you know, his, his home uh, after practice and just kind of locking himself in in the dark. And it, it was just, you know, like you just said, I was wondering how the rest of the league would embrace him. You know, some people might, you know, go at Kevin and say, you know, that's a, that's a sign of weakness. But um, I, I think it opened up the floodgates. It, it made other athletes feel comfortable uh, to come out. And now, you, you know, you, you fast forward to today where just in every sport, you know, Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, college athletes are all coming out and saying, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. And I need a lot of help in this. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, 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 it's a tough road to navigate, I think, because um, I, I think the social media world could be tough. So when Simone Biles came out with her depression, you know, a lot of people embraced it and said, you know, we support you. And a lot of people criticize her for, you know, not being tough enough to perform at the Olympics. So um, I, I, I think it's probably still hard for some athletes, but uh, I'm glad that there are organizations now that offer them the support to really uh, feel comfortable. And, and I'm glad that a person like Naomi Osaka, um, you know, I saw some pictures of her in Greece yesterday. She looks happy. And, you know, she walked away from the sport uh, after the U.S. Open. And, you know, I think she's going to be OK. And we all want to see her back on the field. But, um, you know, it's a tough road to navigate for some of these people. And um, I just think that, um, you know, the, the sports world and organizations should really just em embrace what they're going through. Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like I, I read somewhere that you had spoken at one point about mental health with Pete Sampras back in the day. So this this was quite some time ago. Am I correct with that? I'm yeah. not me. No, not not me. No, uh, Paul. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's right, Bonnie. I'm curious. Back then, when nobody was really talking about it, what was it that spurred that conversation with the two of you? And was that something that stuck in the back of your head when nobody was writing about it? About this is going to come up again somewhere down the road. Uh, well, th first of all, thank you very much for for having me, everyone. It's, it's kind of a I'm flattered. I feel like I'm a, a Lilliput in the land of giants. But um, I, honestly, it, it was just a natural wonder of mine. And it was very similar to, to the question that I asked Naomi Osaka back in July or in August in, in the, the ATP tournament here. Uh, I, I've always wondered how people in the public eye who aren't necessarily comfortable in the public eye uh, but know they have to do it. How, how, does, how does that make their life, lives thousands times more different than, than our own? Um, and I essentially asked Pete the same question that I asked Naomi, which is you, you have all these things happening around you and you have all these obligations to the media. Uh, is there ever a time where you just want to leave it all behind? Is, is there a time when you say my, my career is not worth my mental well-being, I got to get away from it for a while, much like uh, Naomi has done. Um, and it just kind of just kind of sprung from there. We had a very nice conversation. And for a guy that didn't know me from, from John McEnroe, he, he was quite polite 
quite effusive and, and very honest about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, but this is what I love to do. And if, if answering questions from knuckleheads like you is what I have to do to keep doing it, then, then, I'm, then I'm going to. Um, in a couple of minutes, we're going to show a trailer for a film that aired on HBO called The Weight of Gold, just so you guys can tee it up. But I want to follow up on this, Paul, because um, you mentioned that you asked Naomi Osaka a question. It was, you know, she had started talking about her mental health issues back in May, didn't participate in the French Open. Um, and, and your question was somewhere along the lines of how do you strike that balance between not being comfortable with press conferences, but also understanding that your relationship with the press is one of the things that help you build your brand. And, and it was, it seemed like it was a tough question for her to handle. I know that <laughs> there had been some backlash and her agent went to town on you and, and called you a bully and, and things like that. And, and quite frankly, we as journalists are all in situations where after we've had a time to reflect, sometimes we wonder if I had a mulligan, how might I position that differently? So to follow up with you, Peter, if somebody offered you a mulligan, would you have taken it? And if so, how might you have positioned that question differently with the perspective you have now? You asking me or Peter? Oh, I'm asking you. Okay. Um, no, I, I don't know how I say this without coming off as, you know, he, he's all that journalist, you know, it's my right, my, my constitutional right to ask questions. So, but, but I, I want to say that, I, Again, I thought of Sampras when I posed that question to her. Uh, I, and maybe it's a generational thing. I'm an older guy and, and been around the block a while. I, I was a little bit surprised that the question was considered inappropriate by some. Uh, and I, I was really shocked and kind of amused to hear myself called a bully. By, by a guy who doesn't, doesn't know me from Adam. And, and I understand that I interview a lot of people I don't know from Adam either. And I'm sure lots of times I, I make false judgments, but um, I, I just saw it as, as simply as me doing my job. I, I, I really can't explain it any more than that. Yeah, um, I wanna pivot a little bit. So if we, can we tee up that weight of gold trailer real quick, just to, to give us some perspective on the next questions coming up. Great. Michael Phelps is one of the fastest swimmers in the world. None of us had normal childhoods. I wanna win. I knew it was the biggest stage that I would perform for in my life. For Olympians, that's what defines you. Athletes have worked their entire lives for this moment. I wanted to do everything I could to be the best skater I could. Everything revolves around this sole focus, and that sole focus is the Olympics. And now the next 40 seconds will dictate our human lives. But after the Olympics, the village doors close, and that's kind of it. Win or lose, I felt a dramatic emptiness. We're just so lost. A good 80%, maybe more, go through some kind of post-Olympic depression. It's gold, and then what? I didn't develop outside interests. I thought of myself as just a swimmer and not a human being. That's where I was just like, why don't I just end it all? From the outside, it's like you got everything. Athletes just don't talk about our weaknesses. That just cracks the facade. The mainstream media love building somebody up and then come crashing down. Depression puts you into a spiral. You just start getting deeper and deeper into it. He was my best friend. We have to do something, and this is important. Youth around the world watch and look up to these people. I've given my blood, sweat, and tears 
and all I'm asking is that someone can help me get through this. We're human. I don't think I have to say anything else. We're really fortunate to have three people who were involved with the weight of gold on this panel tonight. Amber, this was really early on your baby. You were pushing for this film to be made. Peter, you were absolutely instrumental in bringing Michael Phelps to the table. You were representing several athletes at the time. You're an EP on the film. And Katie, you were one of those athletes. And Katie's hair is back. But if you, you remember that, that shot, where a woman said he was my best friend, Katie, that was you. And you were talking about Stephen Holcomb, who just a few days after his interview took place, he took his own life. So I, I, I certainly don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but the reason why this is such an important topic to talk about it and to figure out the best way to cover it as journalists um, with sensitivity and empathy is because it is so emotional. Katie, when you were first asked to be a part of this film, knowing the stigma around mental health, what was your reaction? Did you want to put your voice, attach your voice to this where you're like, oh yeah, I don't even wanna deal with some of the potential public backlash here. Uh, to be honest, I don't even think I, I fully grasped the concept of what we were doing when I first was asked to join the film. I was still in the midst of dealing with my own mental health struggles in losing Holcomb, uh, issues I had with the Olympic Committee, and uh, kind of coming to terms with what the media really wants, uh, looking at Olympians and, and sports. So I, I would say that I was just mostly concerned for my friend, and I thought that it would be a great way to communicate the environment that the athletes are, are really in. Uh, I think that there are a lot of layers uh, to the world, to, to sports, to even our human psyche. And um, I think that's that's what why this discussion is so interesting. It's like, you know, we're all, we're all super curious about serial killers <laughs> because there's a part of them that like exists in us. And then the same thing with athletes, you know, they're put on this pedestal, they're put into the limelight and to discover that there's more to them than just good and bad and just winning and losing, um, I think helps everyone kind of feel more human. I kind of came to the conclusion at the now recently that extremes are for hyperboles and jokes, uh, that, that, that uh, when you're put in a situation um, like the Olympics or sport, you're kind of consumed by it to a point that you you are put into an extreme situation and to, to balance that in a way that doesn't consume you is a challenge. Um, yeah, and I have a lot to say actually about the, the way the media and, and journalists approach human beings, athletes um, that are in the limelight. I'm, I'm also curious, cause I actually didn't know the question, I think is it Paul? Right. Uh, that you were accused of of being a bully, what was the question? Do you mind if I ask? No, sure. Essentially, it was how do you balance uh, your need for for mental health uh, and privacy with uh, the rest of your life, whether it's uh, an agenda that that you would like to uh, push or uh, a marketing campaign for a clothing line or whatever. How do you balance the two uh, and and, and make yourself look terrific, which she has done, by the way. But I, I understand that it's a, a very hard uh, ledge to walk, especially these days, much more so than in the past. So essentially it was, how do you do this? How do you manage this? And I thought it was appropriate. That question, <laughs> sorry? That question, uh, that, that question doesn't seem to be bullying. Well, I didn't think so. <laughs> I mean, if you asked me that at a dinner uh, outing or whatever, I don't think I'd find it offensive. I mean, I, I thought it was a very logical question to ask. Well, Katie, what are the right questions to ask? From the athlete's perspective, what do you think we as journalists need to be asking about and how can we position them to invite 
you guys as athletes to open up? Man, you know, what is the most interesting uh, for me personally is that I, I tried producing my own little athlete profile and I wanted to tell my own story. And then I, I had to come up with questions to ask myself <laughs> and present. Right, and honestly, it, it was so hard. It is not easy. And the, the challenge that I was presented with, and this is going to sound silly, but it's true, was how do I ask a question that doesn't trigger me? You know, I'm telling very personal, emotional stories about my life. So how do I present that without triggering myself? And also my goal was to inspire others, right? Like, I don't want to just tell a sad story because so often journalists have, would just want to catch the, the, the drama, right? They want to catch the, the sad, the tears, um, the, the trauma, drama and drama. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I found that really challenging. Um, so I think the best approach is to, to have compassion for who you're speaking to and remember that they're human because I even got caught up in wanting to tell a story, forgetting about how it might affect myself and talking about it. So I really had to come up with a way to approach even my own story in a way that was informative and heart-wrenching, but also not damaging to myself because sometimes talking about those things can uh, kind of trigger me or make me feel like I'm going through it again. Um, it's kind of why I'm not a big, big fan of talk therapy, because sometimes just talking about it makes you re-experience it. You're not really learning anything from it. You're not really present through the moment as much. Um, and that might not be the case in every, with every athlete that you encounter. But if you're dealing with someone like Bodie Miller, who lost a family member, myself, I mean, Dan Jansen, there, there are plenty of stories out there that, that require some sensitivity. So I think whatever the athlete is facing that's considered traumatic or dramatic, uh, just maybe think about posing a question that doesn't force them to relive it mm. and maybe gives them the opportunity to reflect or give insight on a perspective that's uh, philosophical or objective. I don't know. I mean, it's a really tough question, Paul, or anyone, or any other journalist on the panel, what, what do you think? Because it's, it's honestly a, a big challenge. Well, Amber, um, you and Peter were both um, executive producers on the film. And I know you had a chance to speak with Holcomb right before he passed. And you also interviewed a bunch of psychologists. So as you were going through this exercise and asking all of these difficult questions, what was going through your mind? Because you had the benefit of education, talking to experts. And how did that guide you um, particularly with the interview with Holcomb. Um, well, thanks for having me on the panel. It's fun to be back at um, the University of Maryland. I haven't been there in, it was 21 years ago when I graduated there. Uh, but um, Katie, I, you know, I, I, you probably don't remember, I was the first person to reach out to you and it was a quick conversation on the phone and I could tell you exactly what you said. You were, you were protective of your friend and you were still very much in that trying to process, I think, what happened um, as, as we all kind of were trying to figure that out at the time. Um, and I saw so I was kind of the journalist and the filmmaker on that side, trying to figure out how we were going to tell the story and trying to approach people like you that were so close to it and, and trying to figure out how to do that. So I can say how hard that is from our side. But um, to answer your question, Bonnie, um, you know, for me, I think when we talk about compassion that comes from education, that comes from educating yourself about a certain topic that you're covering as a journalist. And um, I had the misfortune of having to, my first experience with mental health with athletes was having to report live on air um, during an Orioles broadcast that my good friend, my um, former GM of the Orioles, he was a broadcast partner with us on that network, had taken his, uh, he had died by suicide and a Baltimore County um, police officer called me and told me that they had found him. And so having to report the death of your friend and coworker was my first experience. You know, I was in my early thirties and that was very difficult, but I didn't have the education around mental health to, to fully, I think, do justice to what I should have been able to do to report it. So I think that's why 
um, I gravitated towards Stephen Holcomb's story in the very uh, the very first place. The, the Weight of Gold came about because me and Brett Rapkin, the director of The Weight, Weight of Gold, were shooting a, a story about Stephen Holcomb, the Bob, you know, the captain of the bobsled team. And he had the same eye disease that me and Brett had. And he had actually tried to take his own life um, before Vancouver and, and failed and, and then got a, an eye surgery and uh, went and won gold. And it was, it was a great sports story. And that was the story we were telling when we interviewed uh, Stephen Holcomb. And then to have him, and that mental health was a huge part of that story, that original story. And so when I interviewed him and what became his last interview, um, you know, I spent hours with him that I spent the whole day with him. And, you know, looking back, I see how, how many cues he gave me um, throughout the day. And um, the one thing that stuck with me was that, you know, he said, I'm 37 years old, I believe. I hope I have the age right. I'm 37 years old. This will be my last Olympics. Like this is the end. Um, and that feeling of what is there beyond me as an athlete um, was something that stood out now looking back. Um, so, you know, understanding that feeling of, of identity foreclosure, that I'm only one thing and I don't know what's on the other end when I'm not that anymore. I think um, as a journalist, understanding that helps me now. Um, cover stories like when I had to cover Simone Biles to understand like this was her last Olympics. She had a death in the family. So all of that education makes you a more compassionate reporter or filmmaker. But the biggest things that you know didn't make the film, but I look back at my notes from 2017, I interviewed a sports psychologist. Um, the, uh, his name is Michael Gervais. He's very well known. He gave me five um, I guess personality traits that elite athletes have that you have to have to be the best at anything in the world. None of them translate to the real world. So I pulled out my notes. One is hyper focus. Every morning you get up, you get in the pool, or you get on the ice, or you're in the gym, five doing the same thing, repetitive. Oh, it's it's an obsessive compulsive kind of routine. The other one was narcissism. Uh, the world does revolve around you. It's not even that you choose to be a narcissist. It's that when when you are a Michael Phelps or you are a Simone Biles, everybody in your world depends on you and your focus is always on you. Um, there's a lack of interpersonal re relationships, which we heard Sasha Cohen say in that 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 clip. Um, she never had outside interests. You never you don't have boyfriends, girlfriends, significant others. You don't have this close group of friends through college. It's you're just your people that you're training for the Olympics with. Then there's, um, like I said, the identity foreclosure was the biggest thing for me. Um, I interviewed the parent, the mother of Jared uh, Speedy Peterson, who was in the weight of gold, the, the interview with the mother. Um, and, you know, she, she pulled out a box of stuff that he had. And he, there was a portrait that he painted of himself in fourth grade. You had to do a self-portrait. And he painted a gold medal. It was not a person, it wasn't a face, it was a gold medal. That's identity foreclosure. At eight years old, you foreclose on who you are. And then the last one is you have to be a little bit insane, right? To believe that out of what, 8 billion people in the world, that you're the best, you can be the best at something. Um, so you have to have a little, that's not really based in reality. Most people don't have that feeling. So if you take those I... five characteristics <sighs> and then you, you all of a sudden it's over. And then here you go, you go in the real world. And then you, it's, it's hard to adjust. And I think that's why we see the depression. So that's what I learned from those sports psychologists that I thought was so valuable. And like, wow, I never thought about that. You could apply that to a musician, a, an artist, anybody that's at the top of their game. Well, Peter, you, as somebody who represents athletes, part of your job is knowing them as well as they know themselves, constantly having your finger on the pulse of athletes. Um, you represent Michael Phelps, uh, you have relationships with, you know, uh, Sean White, Apollo Ono, both of whom were in the film. When you were helping pull together the talent for this film, what sort of conversations were you having with them about their level of comfort and their perception, quite frankly, of the way the media was covering mental health? Well, for starters, I, th I think M Michael mentions in the in the trailer that, you know, at least 80 percent of uh, of Olympians, you know, suffer from depression. And 
I've, I've represented Olympic athletes for about 25 years now. And, and I've said for some time that I put it at like 95 plus percent, at least at some level, because, you know, it's, it's that narrowness of focus, but it's also, you go from relative anonymity to like global spotlight and then back to relative anonymity in the space of, you know, two weeks time. And that, that process just, I think is probably impossible uh, to prepare for. And, and so, you know, seeing so many different clients of mine go through, you know, that, that difficulty every two years, um, you know, it, it was, it, it was always a concern and there really wasn't, there really wasn't enough support for these athletes or education, uh, certainly not back then. And, uh, and in Michael's case, uh, when he finished up in, in Rio, literally the day he finished his last race and, and we talked, he said he was recounting his experience as like the, you know, the, the big brother of the team and, and these young kids that were either, you know, no emotion on the, on the metal stand or just, you know, falling apart. And he said, there's nothing for these kids. I mean, this is, uh, it's going to be a disaster. You know, we've got to do something. Um, and, and that's kind of what set in motion some of these thoughts about, well, let's, let's talk about it. And, and what if you were to talk to other athletes um, and see if they may be willing to share their stories? And that's when, when we connected with, uh, uh, with Brett and Amber, they had the interview of, uh, of Holcomb. And at the time, I think that that project had obviously, uh, you know, sort of I don't know if it had been sidelined or taken a different shape, but we had a conversation and I think it became really clear to, uh, to Michael and to us that um, this may be a really good opportunity to have this broader conversation with athletes from different sports and give them, give them an opportunity to uh, share their experiences. And I guess in terms of if this relates to the, the question about how um, journalists you know, deal with these questions. I think, you know, the, the, uh, the concern that I had, I mean, one, I just, I just wanted to, you know, provide an open forum for these athletes to, to talk. Right. So it was, you know, I think that, you know, that some of the best interviews and the most effective interviews may have the fewest questions. I mean, that's not my area of expertise, but from, from, you know, my thinking, it was just, let's create a comfortable, you know, opportunity for athletes, if they want to talk about it, to talk about it. And, you know, one of the things I was pleasantly surprised about were athletes, once they heard about the project, and a lot of it, you know, Michael would talk about it, they, they would, you know, want to be involved, want to talk about it. And that, for me, uh, created this huge sense of uh, responsibility. I mean, that's what I felt. And it's, and so I, uh, sort of in order to, you know, do this project, one of the things that, that I insisted on um, was that we would do all of the interviews and complete the project. By complete, I mean, we everybody's comfortable with this. Every athlete that has shared their story is comfortable. If they no longer want to be a part of it, that's okay too. Before having the conversations with the distribution partner, Simply because I, I, I felt that if these athletes let their guard down, shared their stories, which I think was very like cathartic in and of itself, but it's a huge thing when you're opening up for the first time and, you know, it's on HBO or people are, are, are seeing this and you're, you may change your mind after you've talked about it. So um, I thought that was really important um, because if we had, you know, partnered up with a distribution outlet, um, you know, Katie, as Katie says, I mean, it's, it's, there are other, you know, priorities that, that different folks are going to have in different businesses. And sometimes, well, let's focus on the drama or we really need this, uh, this, you know, part included. And uh, it was truly an athlete driven project from the beginning until we had it at least complete enough where we could present it to HBO and, and, you know, and then we could, consider changes but every athlete was really comfortable with uh with their inclusion and so 
I, I mean, I don't know if that translates to how, you know, you're asking the questions to tr when you're in a live press conference, hoping that they feel that same level of comfort. I don't, that, that's probably a true art, but at any rate, that's, uh, that's how I, I handled it with the, with the athletes that were involved. Well, you bring up an interesting point. And as somebody who's been both in front of the camera and behind the camera, I, I just want to pull out one thing you just said, Peter, which is that realistically, we are in a universe where there is an oversaturation of content. And we are constantly thinking about how do we break through the static? A lot of people know that as clickbait. And it's very easy when you're in a forum where somebody is talking about, let's just stick with mental health, mental health, and you hear that sound bite and you're like, that's it. That's what's going to hook them in. As somebody who's giving advice, like we all are, um, to those of you in the audience, I would just caution that you're careful with clickbait and understand that the source of the clickbait is a human being who is opening themselves up and being vulnerable. And so we have to take those sound bites, which I understand <laughs> that's what's gonna pull the audience in, but let's just try to be careful and mindful of the fact that the people who are creating the clickbait are human beings. Katie, I thought you made a terrific point about how everybody reacts differently and how can we handle that as journalists? Just listen, listen, look at people's body language. And if they stop, it's okay to give them a beat. It's okay to say, do you need a minute? It's okay if you're doing a television interview to ask that they turn the camera off so you can have the respect for that person in the moment for them to breathe and compose themselves. So as somebody who's been on the production side and been in front of the camera, if that's at all helpful, I hope it is. Um, we wanna leave about 20 minutes for your questions. And so Mark, I'd love to just open it up to you. Um, you can add your questions to Q&A. If you're on Twitter, please go to Povich Center, the account and use hashtag unseen stories. And we're keeping an eye on those too. So Mark, what's our first question? Great, Bonnie. Uh, the first question deals with social media and, and it's for everyone on the panel. How has social media changed or heightened mental health challenges among athletes? Who wants to take that? Uh, I'm happy to take it. Go ahead, Katie. Uh, well, so I think there are a couple things I wanna address what, that Amber stated about the five traits. Because like what you were saying about the clickbait, I think that some aspects of what's in social media and what uh, everyone's looking to, to see is, is we want to put people in categories or we want, we want to say that like this trait means you are a narcissist. This trait means that you are this. Um, and I want to communicate that the human psyche doesn't work that way. There's no one trait that's absolute to anything. You want to change based on the context of what you're facing and the stresses you're seeing. And I think that the pressures from social media relate very much so to what athletes face on a broader scale in terms of, of, of being on, in the spotlight. It's just, you know, maybe to someone else, their social media following is just as important or just as taxing as, as an athlete being in front of the entire world in some cases, depending on how, how they're facing it. Because we all have narcissistic traits, right? And uh, I think the social media aspect kind of opens that up to being um, especially if you're a teenager in high school, your, your social circles and what people see on social media are going to be very important to you. Um, and I, I'm not trying to downplay, <laughs> you know, being in front of the world versus like your high school. I'm just trying to show that you can relate as a, as a human being. Um, and th those five traits that Amber mentioned, uh, I would challenge that we would all have those traits in some, some contexts. Uh, I don't know, I kind of blended that into the social media aspect, but I guess I, I'm trying to show that human beings are more than just one thing. And the social media, the media in general just tends to focus on one or want to categorize people. And our human psyche is layered. You can be okay and not okay at the same time. You can be beautiful and not you feel beautiful at the same time. 
you can be have narcissistic traits in one aspect and then go home to your family and not the ability for a human being to compartmentalize what they what they perform how they perform and who they are internally is extremely uh, it's exemplified in the way to gold because there are many athletes that were struggling internally and able to perform so i guess what i'm trying to say is that what we present is truly dependent on facing and I, I'd see social media as another aspect of that. We choose what we want to present to the world, but what we're dealing with inside is completely different. And we're going to utilize the tools we have based on the education and, and the resources we have. What I've discovered is that your environment is extremely important into how you, you utilize those tools based on what you're facing. You have to find a support group and people that make you feel comfortable in being weird and quirky and able to present who you are authentically in the right context. I think the mental health struggles that I've, I've dealt with, the context gets confused and I become unsure of where I am and how to present certain tools. So as athletes, we're trained and we understand where to present those tools when we're performing. But when we're outside of that realm, we're not as trained or, or like experienced in understanding how to function. I challenge for his description of the real world because that's all contextual. And I think that's one thing that we as a society are struggling with right now is understanding that truth isn't absolute, it's contextual. Whatever you are facing is real. Whatever you are facing is true. And I think that, that fact is what would help people understand that the human psyche and our, our conditioning and what we're experiencing is all real. It doesn't, there is no real world. What, where you are is real. Your truth is real in that moment. And so just understanding that each context um, is where you're choosing to present and it's all you can give people comfort. Jerry and Paul, from a social media perspective, are, are you guys both, on, I'm assuming you guys are both on Twitter, right? Unfortunately. I know, right? it, it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> When you are writing a piece about mental health, like Jerry, when you wrote um, the piece for Undefeated about encouraging Naomi Osaka to take some time away, and, and Paul, we, we've already pretty fully documented some of the back and forth that we've had. When you are getting lots of replies to your pieces, how do you as journalists tackle that? Do you respond? Do you defend your case? Do you let it go? Because this is something that all of you in the audience who are early in your journalism careers or you're getting ready to go for jobs, if you're doing pieces around mental health or anything that incites a lot of opinions, you're going to have to deal with this. So um, Jerry, let's start with you. When, when you wrote that piece on Naomi, and I'm sure you got lots of replies, how did you handle it? You know, the, the replies were fine. I'm going to go back to another piece that dealt with Naomi. I wrote a piece that was critical of Serena Williams at the US Open in 2018 when um, Serena lost to Naomi in the yep. final. And um, social media is a very, you have to have really thick skin, as you know, to be on social media because um, Serena has a lot of stands out there. And the amount of abuse that I took after writing that piece, you know, that put a, that probably put a, 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 a test to my mental capacity. Um, it, it was really vile and vicious, and I tried to respond to some of the people, and then I just said, "Stop it." So I don't, even, you know, I, I'll respond to people on social media if they come at me in a respectful way, um, but if they don't, I just ignore it. Or I'll just block it. Now, in terms of the athletes, I, I can't imagine an 18-year-old kid playing for one of the top-ranked football teams and trying to, you know, missing a potentially game-winning field goal and what he's going to face on social media. Um, I, 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 used to, I used to deal with fantasy football and to see on Twitter when a, when a football player gets injured and people have banked their fantasy football teams on that guy and how they rip this guy, even though he's broken his leg on the field. Um, it's so, social media is a really cruel place. And uh, if, if I were advising an athlete, I would tell them to stay away from it. Or even if you're on it and you're attracting fans and, and followers, um, don't respond, don't read, don't engage because it could, it could be a dangerous place and it could be a place where athletes can be destroyed. And uh, I just say, 
just be really careful as you step out there as you, if you're an athlete. Yeah. How about you, Paul? Well, I'm kind of of the opinion that we only have a finite amount of time left to, to live our lives on this planet. And I am never going to spend more than one second of that time responding to a tweet. First, that, that would require me to read one, and I don't. Uh, honest to God, I, I, I am obligated uh, by the people who employ me to, to stay up on social media. And it can be a great tool, great platform. There are links to, to lots of things that I would probably not have had access to or even known about without social media. Uh, that, that, says, that said, it's a cesspool. Um, I had a little bit of it with the Osaka thing and her agent uh, who called me a bully and, 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 and so what? But I, I, I got tweets and, and Facebook posts and emails and on and on from all over the world, literally. Uh, New Zealand, you know, they, they wanted to tell me what a horrible person I am. Well, okay, fine. Maybe, maybe you are too. I, I, I don't know. But it got out of hand. It's just three or four days in a row, nonstop. And I mean, I can take it. I write opinion for a living. I'm a big boy. But after a while, it just got comical. I mean, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, and I will gladly answer emails that, that don't call me names, that, that uh, don't say anything bad about my family. If you have a legitimate question, and it's a smart question, I'll, I'll answer it. Doesn't matter what platform it's on, except Twitter. Um, but, but I don't, like I said, I simply don't, and nobody should have that kind of time to waste on idiots. And they may think I'm an idiot too, that's fine, but I don't inflict myself on them. Yeah, Let's that's, that's, that's them every day. That's great advice, right? You know, like people go to the platform to vent, and that's fine. If they, are asking questions and offering feedback in a healthy way, you want to go down that road okay, but just understand that people are trolls for a reason. If they don't have their face on their profile, it's for a reason. If they don't have their name on their account, it's for a reason. And it's because they are using the platform to find some source of happiness that for whatever reason they're not finding in their own lives. So um, great guidance from Jerry and Paul, um, you as well. Mark, do we have a few other questions we can tackle? We, we absolutely do. Um, here's a question from our friend, David Steele. Oh, who asked, oh David, <laughs> old friend. friend. David Steele. Good question for the whole panel. Does it simplify it too much? to say that much of this comes down to the athletes being viewed as not human and instead as just entertainers or performers or commodities, both by fans and by reporters and media outlets. You know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll take this real quick and I'll hand it off to whoever. Charles Barkley once said, we are not role models and I think it was such a salient point because the greatest athletes in the world are people we can't relate to. We don't have that gift. If we had that gift, we would be competing too. And so there, there's this lack of connectivity on skill. And so we put these people on pedestals and we have expectations of them to succeed and we are invested in them because we care. And when they don't meet our expectations, so many people somehow take it personally. Um, and that's really what comes to mind when I hear that question. Katie, how do you feel when you hear it? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, it's, so, it's so multifaceted, honestly, because uh, I understand all perspectives. And I think like uh, it, it could depend on, on my mood of the day, you know, like, I want to say, oh, no, I'm not a role model to alleviate myself of the pressure. But the fact is, even in my life outside of the, the limelight, I'm a role model to the kids around me because they like hounds or my my nephews or my nieces because they look up to me for those reasons. You know, I'm an athlete. I'm their aunt. It's a human, though. Do you sometimes feel based on the feedback that either you've gotten or <laughs> other athletes have that you are seen as something other than human because you have this God-given gift that most of us don't have. 
Oh, a hundred percent. But, but I guess what I was going to get at is that sometimes I feel that from even close friends and family, because they're so focused on what I do and what that means to them instead of who I am. And I, I don't think that it's, it's restricted to solely people in the limelight or people that are, are, are famous. I think that Th those same issues can can arise on a lower level in, in different aspects of your family. Like if you have that one person, you know, that's like the sailor or the, the Navy SEAL or whatever. I think it's 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 applied, applied more broadly or this is what's made me feel better about it or more normal or in the real world, uh, because I just try to, to to relate it to something that we all experience. Just one might be more intense than another. But if I have the understanding that people deal with this at a lower level or something that's not as um, intense because the whole world is involved. It helps me create an environment in my head or at least that I have like my community and my people and my own boundaries. I think that every athlete experiences that feeling of being a cog in a machine or a commodity because they're, we are forced into situations where people are asking us questions that you know they don't have any invested interest in. They don't really care about you they only care about your performance so in that respect 100 percent, yes you're correct I've, I've felt that way and I think all of us have because people don't know us they only know what we do Peter um, you are surrounded on a daily basis by some of the greatest athletes on earth and Olympic athletes I feel have even more pressure than most athletes because their window for monetizing and truly making transformational money, that window is so small. It comes once every four years. And if you don't get gold or silver or bronze, then you're basically persona non grata. In your mind, because of the people that you're exposed to, how can we as journalists do a better job humanizing, making that connection between yes, they are great, but yes, they are also just like the person who works at the grocery store, the person who works on Wall Street, the person who is selling cars at the Ford dealership. Yeah, I think you can you can uh, you can be you know blown away by hey that's that's Michael Phelps like, in the airport and want to get a selfie or whatever an autograph, but you can approach them you know as you would someone in the grocery store. I mean it, that's that's you know, that's one way to do it. I mean, just treating people, seeing people uh, as people, not just as, you know, some iconic athlete. But I, I think it's not, I don't think it's a, you know, these athletes are subjected to that by, you know, fans and, uh, and media. I mean, I think it's part of a much bigger ecosystem that begins at a much younger age where, you know, as a society, we value performance, we value success, we, you know, may each define success differently, but we, there are a lot of commonalities in terms of, of uh, what we consider to be worthy of fame or success. And so the athletes that you're referring to, like Olympic gold medalists, probably have been, um, have, have felt different and special from a very young age and, and their environment, you know, as, as Katie says, I mean, their environment probably treats them a little bit differently from a very young age, long before they ever get to the, you know, Olympic, um, Olympic games, if they even get there. And so uh, I, I, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a much sort of broader issue. And I think that, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think it's important to encourage, you know, parents and youth sports uh, coaches and administrators to to start to, you know, you know, prioritize balance at a younger age. You know, maybe push back a little bit on the, um, you know, celebrating just that level of performance or success and isolating those athletes. And similarly, for parents to, you know, to try to establish some balance for the kids, even if they're very special athletes. I think that most of them, you know, it's an internal drive and, and talent that, that will get them down the road. I don't think that they necessarily need to be made to believe that this is your, your path. This is your only path. 
And if you just get there, everything in life will make sense. You will realize all of your, um, you know, all of your satisfaction because that's that I've not seen that happen. Not even with, you know, (laughs) these Olympians that, you know, win everything. It just doesn't happen that way. What I, I like about what he just said is the uh, cre- the balance or creating. I don't know. I don't know if balance truly exists, but creating the space and time for yourself and not just what you do, so that you understand why you're involved in it, and that 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 it's exactly what Peter said. It's not that you'll have all the answers to life, right? Like, because that doesn't exist. <laughs> so, creating the space to find your own answers on top of what you do. I really like that, Peter. That's awesome. This is so awesome. Mark and I were talking about this the other day when we were doing some prep. I I can't think of another panel that's been able to bring so many different perspectives around mental health. We have, you know, we've got journalists, we've got an athlete, we've got, you know, the agent who deals with these folks on the day to day. And so I I feel like we're getting some great, well-rounded perspective. But Mark, we got a few minutes. Can we squeeze more in? We're not, we're certainly not going to get to all the questions. That is for sure. Um, Here's the last question. And again, I think it's for the entire panel. We've heard tonight from athletes who acknowledge their struggles with mental health. Do you know of athletes who are not willing to talk publicly? And does the stigma persist? Peter, why don't you take that? Yeah, the answer is yes, I do. And I think that, uh, I mean, it's different for everybody, but I, if I if I had to Uh-oh. characterize it, I would say that it's uh, um, it's the the fear that you know how they will be viewed by the world because that's how they view themselves. I mean, they are in that position when you're an Olympic gold medalist, and everything you do, you're not only thinking about what you're doing, but you're thinking about how the world is going to perceive you. And I think that is that can be terrifying, terrifying. And so, um, so it's a legitimate concern. And it's not like you can just, all right, I'm just going to open up. I think you have to be prepared for it. And uh, and that's a it's an intimidating process. So yes, it still happens. Although a lot of progress is being made, the stigma is being uh, is being reduced. I think. And you know, programs like this. I mean, I think this is really helpful. I mean, we've made a, a lot of progress you know, in, in a handful of years. So I think fewer and fewer athletes will have that reluctance as we move forward. Amber, I know you have to get ready to do your show, but um, you, you talk to athletes, former athletes all the time. They were on set with you when you were at NFL Network. When you talk to folks about working, I know Reggie Bush was one of the guys you brought up with me. When you were talking to these guys, were there any who were like, mm, not ready to open that Pandora's box yet? Um, And yeah, I do have to go and I apologize that I'm going to dip out, but I'm on the air in about four minutes. Um, But yeah, two things I want to say is when um, Brett and I were first trying to get the weight of gold off the ground, we're kind of reaching out to see what athletes, you know, Michael Phelps and and Peter were one of some of those people we reached out to who would be interested. And the only athlete that kind of responded like, uh, I'm going to pass was was Lindsey Vaughn. And the reason was, and it, it was it was very honest, it was, um, I'm getting ready to compete again, and I, I can't have anything out there that makes me appear weak. I mean, it wasn't from her directly, it was from her representatives. Like, she can't, this is, she thinks it's great what you guys are doing. She can't, because she's getting ready to compete, she can't have that out there because then that could create a distraction, everybody talking about her mental illness, you know, which is understandable. Um, then the second thing with the NFL players, as I was doing some of these interviews, you know, they'd be in the green room with me and I'd, they'd hear me on the phone and they're like, what are you working on? And I told them, you know, this, this movie, I'm, I'm trying to get off the ground. And uh, they were like, hey, if you ever want to do one about the NFL, let me know. And Reggie Bush was one of them um, because he was like, you know, there's so nobody ever asks us about our mental health, especially as African American men, like our culture, we are raised to be very tough. And then football adds to that. Um, And he was telling me a lot of things, just even like growing up without a dad, having to be the man of the house, very young and having to be strong. And there just wasn't the space there to, to talk about um, mental issues. So I, I think that would be fascinating one day to to kind of open that discussion up with especially NFL players. Um, there's CTE involved. There's a whole bunch of other things that add to to depression and stuff after, especially post um, 
post playing days. So I think that it was it was nice to hear some of those men be vulnerable and they wanted to talk about it. I think that's progress in the, in the sport of football. Well, the nice thing is societally, we are starting to destigmatize things like mental health and sexual preference. But we also have to realize we're not quite there yet. It is a very polarizing topic and Mark to sort of put a bow on this, knowing that most of our audience is journalists. If you have the opportunity to talk about these issues with athletes, understand that you are in an incredible position of privilege because people are talking about a very challenging subject and trusting you with their story. So sensitivity, education, compassion, empathy. If you can kind of keep those things at the top of mind where you're, when you're talking to athletes or whomever in real time, and as you're crafting your stories for print, digital, radio, TV, whatever, um, if, I, if I can impart that little bit of um, experience, uh, wisdom that comes from experience, maybe that would be it. Mark? Well, I want to agree with Peter Carlisle that this has been a great panel. And, and we have the right panelists and the right moderator for the subject. So I wanna thank you all so much. Um, before we leave, I wanna repeat the information that, that Caitlin provided at the top about the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 1-800-273-8255 and the website suicidepreventionlifeline.org. It's important for us to provide that I think for our audience. Um, and then finally, I, I'd like to let our audience know that the, the POVID Symposium, the annual POVID Symposium will be November 16th this year. And we will be announcing our topic and our panelists next week. And we look forward to seeing you again um, on November 16th for our next event. So thank you again to all of our panelists and to Bonnie You've been great. Really appreciate your time and to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.